he says that the, the genuine sport practice without any design for reward and social success is an example of, of introversive labor. Um, he, he refers explicitly to the mountain climber, and he liked to climb mountains. It means his, um, even until late in his life, he was a, a mountain climber. He used to go up to Vermont after he moved to the U.S. and would go back to Austria to walk in the mountains. Um, and also truth, a truth seeker. Okay, he refers to, to, to the truth seeker, and by that he means the person who's only interested in pursuing science for reasons of, of truth. Okay, and of course he was a truth, a great truth seeker. Um, and he says, uh, that both of these activities do not involve the disutility of labor. Rather, quote, it is precisely overcoming the disutility of labor that satisfies him. Thus a genuine truth seeker, and now I'm, uh, or rather, thus genuine truth, truth seeking, uh, in any scientific discipline qualifies economically as consumption and its pursuit as a vocation. Okay? So if you do economics because you want to seek truth, because you want to discover new truth, um, it's really an act of consumption. Okay? You're doing it because you enjoy it. I enjoy it. Okay? Um, Ludwig von Mises enjoy, enjoyed doing it. All right? Um, he, uh, he goes on and says that the pursuit of almost any vi- vocation, quote, requires not only the personal efforts of the individual's concern, but also the expenditure of material factors of production and the produce of other people's extraversive labor that must be bought by the payment of wages. So, in other words, you have to purchase certain equipment to play basketball. That doesn't ma- you have to invest in certain equipment. That doesn't make it extraversive. Okay? You're purchasing it be- because you want to attain a certain goal from the activity itself. Okay? The same thing is true for the scientist who um, is, is doing it. Uh, he needs he needs um, other things. He needs a lab. He needs assistance and so on. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not something pursued for its own sake. That's a, probably the best way to define introversive labor, uh, an activity pursued for its own sake. Um, so, in other words, the search for new truth in, in economics, as in any pure science, uh, requires, in addition to introversive labor, an institutional framework Okay, composed of what we call complementary goods. Even pursuing economics for its own sake, I still need access to a computer. I still need paper, pencils. I still need to interact with other minds. I still need access to a library. I need a lot, the products of many other people's extraversive labor. And that's, by the way, what, for example, the Mises Institute provides. Okay, it provides this institutional and material fr- um, framework or infrastructure for pursuing t- truth. Now, the founding members of the Austrian school, Menger, von Bawerk, and Wieser, um, pursued economic research neither for pecuniary gain nor because they saw professional recognition or an influence on public policy. Okay, Before, Mises, uh, before Menger got a chair, he, he was um, uh, a journalist, and he was working only as a journalist so that he could pursue his love of economics. Okay, And he was writing his, his great principles book while he was working as a journalist. Okay, and he find, then he finally got a chair at the University of Vienna. It didn't change his attitude towards economics. So according to Mises, quote, when Menger, Bombavark, and Wieser began their scientific careers, they considered it as their vocation, Mises uses that word, to put economic theory on a sound basis, and they dedicated themselves entirely to this cause. Okay, so vocation, dedication, two words that Mises uses about the great masters of Austrian economics, um, which... Um, indicate that they were vocational economists. Uh, these three eminent Austrians, therefore, were not economists by profession, but by vocation. Okay, now, that's not to say that a vocational economist does not desire a position in academia. You have to, one of the complementary means of, of pursuing truth-seeking is to stay alive. I mean, you need food and you need other things, shelter, clothing. So, you do have to pursue, you have to earn, earn an income somehow, unless you, you get some rich patron to take care of you, okay? Um, so the, uh, the vocational economist takes a position in academia or works in, other, in, in, in some other profession, such as banking, journalism, industry, or government, in order to obtain the concrete means necessary to sustain and to complement his efforts, uh, to discover new truths or to expound and apply established truths, in, in, in his economic research and writing, okay. Now, in contra, let me just give you an example. Henry Hazlitt was a, was a, was a dedicated economist. Um, he had jobs successively at, at Business Week, the New York Times, and Business Week, and then then at the Foundation for Economic Education. Um, he earned his income in different ways, but the end 
that he was pursuing was that of, of seeking truth in economics and expounding it. He was a great writer, okay, and great popularizer of, of, of economic truths. Uh, the professional economist, in contrast, aims at earning a livelihood, achieving profession, professional acclaim from his peers, achieving public fame, shaping political policies, or most likely a combination of these ends. Paul Krugman comes immediately to mind, right? Um, he's someone who, 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 want, who loves, you know, basks in, in, in the public uh, limelight. Uh, he, he loves a, a claim from his, his peers, which he has gotten uh, with the Nobel Prize. Uh, and, um, and he loves to have an influence on political policies. These are all extraversive goals, goals that, that he's pursuing economics to achieve these other goals. Right. So, so the difference between the vocational economist and the professional economist is not their objective method of earning a living, but the subjective aims and, uh, aimed at, subjective ends aimed at, which are unobservable. So you can see two guys doing similar things in, 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 a, in an economics department, teaching a full load, let's say three courses per semester, which is nine contact hours, which is why it's a cool job. You hardly have to work. But one of them is doing it to earn a living, and 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 maybe to to write some things that bring about some recognition from the public. Another is doing it because he wants to um, advance the frontiers of economic theory. So objectively, you cannot tell which is the vocational economist, which is the professional economist. Okay, I mean you have some indication. Um, you know, we know Paul Krugman is a professional economist in the sense I'm talking about, and that uh, Murray Rothbard was a vocational economist. Okay. We don't know with scientific certainty, but we certainly know it with what Mises might use the word phimological, that is insight into other people, okay? Just by insight into their, into their writings and so on, we know what, what they're up to, okay? So, um, vocational economists like Murray uh, Rothbard are not allergic to using the unfashionable terms truth and law. Professional economists never talk about economic truth and economic law. You know, Krug Krugman says that, that this policy, well, you know, there's a lot of studies that, that this one may be better, and we have some theories that say that this one, this one will be better, the Keynesian policies. Um, but you never see, um, in, in economics, uh, textbooks and so on, references to truth. Okay. For Rothbard, ec- economics is actually a, a, a substantive body of immutable and universal laws that are logically deduced from the fact that people employ means to attain their m- most um, important ends. That is, that they act. Okay, that's the starting point of, of, of Austrian economics. It's a true axiom. Um, if you try to deny it, as, as Hans Hoppe might say, it's a performative contradiction, and you don't want to contradict Hans Hoppe. Um, and uh, because you're acting... Uh, while you're you're acting or aiming at a goal of of, of contradicting this premise, okay. So uh, Rothbard wrote that quote: "All these elaborated laws of economics are absolutely true, and that quote economics does furnish existential laws, laws of our existence, of the existence of reality." Um, also, if you look at Rothbard's life in the 1950s and 60s, he was working on Austrian economics in virtual isolation. He was writing Man, Economy, and State in the 1950s. Uh, writing other works in the 60s. Um, he never, he did not obtain a full-time academic position until 1966. Before that, he was living, making a precarious living on foundation grants, okay? Um, and in fact, he revealed in an interview in 1990 that he was quite content during this period as a vocational economist. He wasn't making a lot of money, but he, he, he says that uh, any chance to write a book or meet new people was terrific, to meet and influence new younger economists. So these are the views and attitudes of the ideal vocational economist. Okay. It's not a vow of poverty. You want to make as much, all other things equal, you want to make as much money as possible. Okay. But one of the highest rank, ranking of your goals, okay, is the, the, the pursuit of truth in economics. So Paul Samuelson, on the other hand, exemplifies the, um, the, the professional economist par excellence in the modern era. Okay. He's sort of the pre-Krugman Krugman. Um, he once declared, and he was actually right about this, he once declared, it's a grandiose declaration, he says, quote, I can claim in talking about modern economics, I am talking about me. He wrote the foundations of economics, which completely revolutionized economic theory and made it a mathematical discipline, okay, unquote. Um, 
And I, I write that he, you know, he spoke, he spoke truer words, he spoke, he spoke truer than he knew. Okay, because in his approach to economic research, Samuelson is a self-proclaimed follower of the, the views of the, the, one of the early positivists, Ernst Mach. Okay. Um, now according to Samuelson, for these people, for the Machians, um, good theories are simply economical descriptions of the complex facts of reality that pretty well replicate those already observed or still to be observed facts, unquote. So what he's saying here is that um, economic theory is formulated as a, a shorthand summary of past experience. It doesn't come from uh, deducing truth from, from true axioms, okay? Um, and what are these past events and experiences. Well, really, they're, they're just non-repeatable historical facts that cannot possibly shed light on immutable causal laws. You need some prior theory to make sense of, of the real world. Um, peanut butter consumption in the U.S. last year may have gone up by 10%, okay? Or yet, did that cause the, the fall in housing prices by another 30% this year? Well, it happened, you know, may have. We know it didn't, though, because we have immutable uh, causal laws. We know that, that, that peanut butter consumption um, has no theoretical connection to the, the um, fall in the price of housing. Okay, And most economists really don't accept this Samuelsonian position, though they would, many of them would, would, would pay lip service to it. Okay. Um, now, he... he he, he still, he embraces this view of economic theory, Samuelson does, because I, I was just summing up what Mach said. Um, and he says, quote, not for philosophical reasons, but purely out of long experience in doing economics that other people will like and that I myself will like. So he likes doing that kind of economics. You know, it's kind of cool. Um, he says, when we are able to give a pleasingly satisfactory how for the way of the world, that gives us the only approach to why that we shall ever attain. We can never know why we have a business cycle, according to Samson. We, we can, according to von Mises and Rothbard, Hayek, and, and, and the Austrian economists who have spoken to you this week. Okay. Now, what did um, Samson come up with? What did this type of economics, as a shorthand of past experience, yield in his hands? Well, he and his MIT colleague, Solo, came up with the long discredited, now long discredited Phillips curve. That is that the rate of inflation, percent change in the price level is negatively correlated with the percent change in, um, I don't remember if it was GDP or unemployment. Unemployment, of course, unemployment, yeah. Percent change in unemployment. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, percent of unemployment. So, if you have a percent change in the price level of, price is going up by 6%, well then you can get the unemployment rate down to 2%. On the other hand, if you want to fight inflation, well, you're, let's say, and have a 3% inflation rate, you're going to do so at the cost of having, let's say, a 7% unemployment rate. Okay? And he, well, how did he get that? Well, he looked at a, a scatter of dots that represented unemployment and inflation in different historical periods in the past in the U.S. economy. They don't even look like that. There's much more. Okay. Um, and he ran a regression. And using the least squares method, he came up with this nice line. And uh, that was in 19, I believe his, his article came out in 59. He took his inspiration from a, Brit, a, a much smarter Australian economist who didn't really attribute this, didn't really um, um, interpret this in the same way Samuelson Solo did. What Sam, Samuelson and Solo said, and Solo's name is S-O-L-O-W, was that this is a menu of choices for the policymaker, for the central planner. Okay? That look, if you want six percent, if you want two percent unemployment, it's going to cost you six percent inflation. Okay, so this, this is the menu. You just read off the menu where you want to be, uh, where where are social preferences um, you know, optimized? Okay, here or here. Okay, okay. That com that, that analysis was completely discredited by the stagflation, that is, an increase in both unemployment and the um, uh, inflation. In 1969-70, and then more strongly in the stagflation of 73-75, of okay, where we had um, you know 10 or 12 percent in, in inflation, and, uh, and and unemployment was you know seven eight percent, and of course 
they never apologize for this stuff. They never say, oh, I was wrong, or, you know, the, the, this Machian um, approach that somehow, you know, we just can look at the past and get lost for the future is ridiculous. They don't say things like that. You know, they try to come up with, well, everything's shifted out like this. Way, you know, they don't explain why, and, but, you know, so it's shifted to the right. But, but Friedman uh, destro- destroyed this with his, his, his article, um, written in, 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 in the late 60s, in which he, he, he uh, basically said that in the long run, there is no inverse relationship. Okay, Austrians would say even really in the short run, uh, the relationship may exist very temporarily, but it, it, it disappears, okay? You might, uh, and in fact, you might be able to push down unemployment, but you do so not by make, creating jobs that, that add value to the economy, but by causing malinvestments. So even in the short run, it isn't what Samuelson and Solo claimed it would be. Okay? So, um, this, this is Machian theorizing in action. Okay? And for, without a doubt, the Phillips curve for, for a time was well liked by Samuelson, Solo, and other professional economists. It was, it was used by, by policymakers. But it's con, it's truth content. Okay, there's that word truth that they don't like. Um, in the face of the stagflation that developed in the 1970s was nil. It didn't have any truth content. It, it was, it was a lie. I mean, it wasn't maybe a conscious lie. Okay. So, um, a little bit more about Samuelson. The, the, the professional economist really doesn't have to worry too much about whether a theory is true or not because his reward for pursuing economic research lies elsewhere. According to Samuelson, Quote, in the long run, the economic scholar works for the only coin worth having. And guess what that is? Our own applause. So you're writing to impress other members of the economics profession. You're not writing to, to advance the cause of truth. Um, elsewhere, Samuelson describes scientists, including professional economists, as being as, quote, avaricious and competitive as Smithian businessmen. That is, the businessmen in Adam Smith's text, The Wealth of Nations. The, and I'm quoting Samuelson still, the coin they seek is not apples, nuts, and yachts, nor is a coin itself, though, of course, um, Ivy League professors get all of those things in abundance, okay? Um, nor, is it, you know, nor is a coin itself, or power, as that term is ordinarily used, though they're certainly very present in the halls of power today. Scholars seek fame. The fame they seek is fame with their peers, the other scientists whom they respect and whose respect they strive for. Okay, so economics is an extra verse of activity, okay, explicitly to these people. Um, okay, now Mises gives an interesting sociological um, interpretation of why academic researchers in sciences like mathematics and economics, that is non-empirical sciences, or what Mises would call a priori sciences, um, why, they, why they are so easily diverted from seeking truth to uh, striving after other ends. Okay? As universities traditionally developed from the Middle Ages, the, 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 the professor was seen as someone who would not only teach, but would also, and, 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 and actually more um, significantly, advance truth. Okay? So what Mises points out is that it's easy in the natural sciences to do this. Okay? It's not easy to do this, but it's easy to pretend you're doing this. You run the same experiments as a truly creative genius in the natural sciences. Sciences, You use the same methods that he uses, okay? The same material means that he uses, but your results are, you know, they're, 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 they're minimal. But, but, but you're doing exactly what he's doing, okay? What the creative genius is doing. And, um, however, when you're in these sciences like math, and economics, pure theory takes a lot of sustained thought. It's very difficult to do. So what happens is that economics, or the economists that cannot do this, then move over into other branches like economic history. They begin to say that, well, economic history is really is what, what's, what is important. Uh, looking to the past, collecting data, because anyone can collect data. Okay, Anyone can come up with some sort of interpretations that are, are plausible of past data. Um, so Mises concluded that in economics, there's nothing that the routinist, he, he loved that word, you know, the, the, the person that, that can't do much except follow a routine without any creative, in, creative inspiration. Uh, there's nothing the routinist can achieve according to a more or less stereotype pattern as, the, as he could do in the natural sciences. There are no tasks which require the conscientious and painstaking effort of sedulous monographers, people who, who collect data and, you know, pour over it and so on. Um, there is no empirical research. All must be achieved by the power to reflect, to meditate, and to research. 
There is no specialization, as all problems are linked with one another. In dealing with any part of the body of knowledge, one deals actually with the whole. And you can see this from human action and man, economy, and state. That if you really want to deal with labor economics, you have to have the whole system of economics at hand. Okay. Um, that's not to say that lesser economists than Mises and Rothbard, you know, such as, 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 as myself and others here, cannot advance that system, okay, in a piecemeal fa- fashion. But you first have to understand the full system before you can make any advances or apply it to explaining, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the financial meltdown. And so Mises goes on to say that, um, this is the explanation for why many people turn to economic history. In particular, now he takes aim at the, the great enemies of the Austrian school, the German historical school in the 19th century. Um, and so Mises says about them, the fiction that in the sciences all professors are equal does not tolerate the existence of two types of professors in economics. Those who work independently in economics as original theorists and those who come from economic history and description. Okay, those are the two classes. The inferiority complex of these empiricists give them a prejudice against theory. So they hate theory. And this is, explains the, the blind hatred by the, um, uh, the historical school of the Austrian school. When Menger wrote Principles of Economics, he sent it to the, the leading representative of the um, historical school, which was Gustav Schmoller. And um, Schmoller Schmo- 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 opened the book and, and, and just threw it in his waste paper basket. He said that he's not going to read something that upsets him. Okay. Um, and he, wrote, he wrote that back to Menger that he, you know, the moron. <laughs> okay, so by, by, by the 1920s, the German historical school, the Austrian school had achieved international fame by the 1920s. The German historical school was on its last legs, but still controlled the professor, professorial chairs in Germany. Um, the members of the third generation of the school were, were a dull and undistinguished lot, and they were, um, except for one person that Mises sort of liked personally and thought was smart, but, but was the consummate professional economist. His name was Werner Sombart, who had been a student of Gustav Schmoller, the leading German historicist of the second generation. Mises, who knew Sombart personally, portrayed him as a quintessential professional economist. It is worthwhile quoting in full Mises' entertaining and eviscerating description of Sombart, because the personality that emerges is the antithesis of the vocational economist and represents really the professional economists today. And this, this is just one of the best passages in the history of economic thought, tearing somebody apart. Um, so Mises says, Werner Zumbart was the great master of his set. He was known as a pioneer in economic history, economic theory, and sociology. And he enjoyed a reputation as an independent man because he had once aroused Kaiser Wilhelm's anger. Um, Professor Zumbart really deserved the recognition of his colleagues because to the greatest degree, he really combined in his person all of their shortcomings. <laughs> he never knew any ambition other than to draw attention to himself and to make money, which is exactly what the professional economist strives after. His imposing work on modern capitalism is a historical monstrosity. <laughs> he was always seeking public ap- applause. He wrote paradoxes because he could then count on success or paradoxes that people, you know, little puzzles that he presented to the public. He was highly gifted, but at no time did he endeavor to think and work seriously. <laughs> I mean, this is just great. Of the occupational disease of, of, of German professors, delusions of grandeur, he had acquired an elephantine share. <laughs> when it was fashionable to be a Marxian, he professed Marxism. When Hitler came to power, he wrote that the Führer receives his orders from God. Okay, and I actually looked that up uh, in, in his book on um, uh, modern German socialism. I think it's called. Um, it was actually it actually had a name like National Socialism, but but his followers changed it when I translated it into a, into um, uh, into English as modern German socialism or something like that. Um, so you know, he so he was a Nazi. Okay, even the Nazis thought he was crazy. Okay, they, they sort of, they, they kept their distance from him. You know, you know, saying that Hitler was actually God. And, okay. Um, there's an interesting book which talks about Zombard and, and the Nazis. He, he was always trying to get in good with them, but they, again, they, they thought he was a little bit too extreme and that, you know, they were afraid that Hitler might not like them if they got involved. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, um, we can sum this up by saying that professionalist aspirations and um, 
The culture it, it breeds are not only inconsistent with truth-seeking in economics, how they are positively antithetical to it, okay? For the professionalization of a scientific discipline, particularly when it's a social science, of a priori science like economics, almost always proceeds hand-in-hand hand with the, with the um, expansion of government intervention. And Mises writes, and, and really, truly um, so, the development of a, profe- of, of, of a profession of economics is an offshoot of interventionism. So he's saying the p- economics profession comes about as a result of interventionism. There's no if, ends, or buts in, in that statement. It's unqualified. Uh, what's the reason for this inevitable connection? Okay, well, there's two facts. One, the state requires a class of intellectuals and specialists for designing, implementing, and providing rationalizations for various interventions into the market. It has to be sold to the people, the property owners that are being exploited by the state. Just as you had the, the church during the times of, 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 of the um, absolute monarchs justifying uh, their edicts because they were, they were, you know, descended from God or whatever. Uh, in the modern era, you have the um, economists, the intellectuals justifying the state. This is a big theme in, in a lot of Murray Rothbard's writings. Okay. And secondly, those intellectuals who seek the regular income and prestige that, that accompany the professionalization of their discipline are always ready to oblige because the ability of an intellectual to earn his living researching and writing in his chosen field on the free market is always precarious at best. In other words, before economics was professionalized, you had to have another job. And economics was your vocation. And I submit that, that the, the, uh, and, and, and you know, Mises would say the same thing, that what was written by these vocational economists was much better than, than, than what, what is being written today by the, the, the run of the mill economists. In fact, Mises makes a statement that, I think he says, at no time in history has more than a score, has there been living more than a score of economists that have contributed anything to economics. Okay. And that's probably still true today. Okay. Maybe because population has increased, maybe it's, you know, two or three score. Okay. Um, okay. So as the intervention state expands, it reinforces the need for trained experts and the university system obtains increasing subsidies from the government to initiate and expand graduate programs, because that's where all the evil comes from, that will provide such personnel. The lucrative positions in these programs are naturally bestowed on the economists who spearhead the drive to professionalize. Now, when was the U.S. Um, economics profession professionalized? Um, there's a great book by Michael Bernstein, which is called Perilous Journey, on the professionalization of the American economics profession. Uh, and I, I highly recommend the book. Um, he's kind of a left-wing historian, but he's got great insights into all this stuff. And it's basically war and the warfare state. Um, he writes um, very perceptively, un- quote, under the novel and unrelenting demands posed by national mobilization, modern economic theory had proved its worth. Not individualism, but rather statism provided the special circumstances within which the high hopes and great expectations of general generations of professionalizers could be realized. So from the 1880s onward, economists were pushing for, to, to, for a, a profession. They were pushing for regular uh, um, jobs in academia, uh, for excluding people who didn't have PhDs. They all went to Germany to get their PhDs. Many of them did, okay, in the 1870s and 1880s. And they came under the uh, influence of the historical school. Uh, the founders of the American Economic Association were all basically historicist-influenced economists, okay, as, as Bernstein points out. And I'm still quoting him, it is one of the great ironies of this history that a discipline renowned for its systematic portrayals of the benefits of unfettered competitive markets would first demonstrate its unique operability in the completely regulated and controlled economy of total war. So World War I brought them their great first great opportunity. They all went to Washington, they had great jobs, they had power, they had prestige, okay? They ran the sort of war economy in the U.S. Um, but as the budget sh- shrunk afterwards, as the budget shrank, the government budget shrank afterwards, they went back to their jobs in academia. But they, they had a renewed inspiration to professionalize the discipline and, 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 to be, and, and to get permanent jobs in the government apparatus. So economists after World War I became big interventionists. They kept pushing for the expansion of the state. Okay. Um, they, so they began reorganizing the discipline and reshaping its educational methods 
and requirements so as to accommodate the uh, prospective need um, of well, this is actually after World War II now. Okay, after World War One, they you know they they were pushing for it. Then World War Two occurred, and we, we had a really just a, a, a fascist corporatist state. Okay, we had a fascist war economy, which used a lot of economists. Almost all of the the generation of economists that um, grew up in that wartime era, Paul Samuelson, J- James Tobin, you can go through all the big names. They all worked for one or another agency in the war economy. John Kenneth Galbraith became the head of the um, Office of Price Administration. He was the head price controller. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, he, and there's some disgusting passages in his memoirs in which... Um, He's talking about, you know, the, the, uh, some, some, some poor guy who runs a trucking company comes in and is begging for, uh, uh, the permission to raise his prices so that he can pay his wages and, you know, of course taxes are rising and everything. And, and, and Goldbraith would just make it, you know, like, like that was his hand and then all the others would just go right along and they would, they would play with the guy. They say, oh, you really need it, really, you know. But as soon as he did that, it meant that let, let's screw this guy and they would just get rid of him. They would say, no, you can't have it. You know, they let him go on thinking he's going to get it. So he's you know, totally disgusting bureaucrat, um, fascist. Um, and, and by the way, he worked for um, the Air Force in assessing the um, success of the carpet bombing, which is you know the mass murder of civilians uh, in Germany. Um, and you know, on technical grounds, he said, "Well, I don't think it's working." But you know, nothing about the murder or anything like that. Um, yeah, so he has a lot, to, a lot to answer for. Hopefully, he's doing it right now in a place that's not very cool. Um, um, so, so Bernstein gives an incisive account of how the American econ- economic profession finally established itself in service to a centralized interventionist Leviathan state. Let me quote from him uh, one more time. Um, World War II provided the first systematic demonstration of the beneficence to be won from the largesse of the central government. As a matter of course, there emerged a determination to evaluate and reconfigure educational programs in, in, in the field, more rigorously stipulate its varieties of expertise and methodologies, and pursue consensus about its central principles and policy orientations. That is to say, that out of the crucible of national mobilization came the beginnings of a professional identity and self-confidence that while resolutely sought after since the late 19th century, had up to that point been elusive and fleeting. So what they had been searching for from the 1880s onward developed out of World War II, the most destructive war in history. And that's when we began getting full-blown graduate programs with with certain requirements um, that were uniform across all universities. And when, because now we had a permanent national security state, okay, the Cold War heightened this. You needed more economists now to work full time in the government because the Cold War was really never ending. Okay, um, and what's interesting in the book, Bernstein de- um, goes on and points out which disciplines developed during these periods. One was a discipline that's gone into decline, but uh, was still big in the seventies. Um, the the decision making sciences, so that's coming back, such as linear programming and operations research. They were developed during World War II to solve the logistical problems associated with supplying overseas troops in different theaters of, um, of operations. Game theory was reoriented and refined to assist in the solution of strategic military problems associated with the Cold War conflict. Okay, They got generous funding from the Department of Defense and especially the Office of Naval Research, which started the RAND Corporation. So Thomas Schelling, the winner of the Nobel Prize, was one of the people who was involved in this from the very beginning and... Um, you know what, what 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 he was doing was basically focusing on the best way to deploy nuclear weapons and, and what sort of strategy to use. Okay, um, Tyler Cowen, who li- who uh, likes Schilling, um, wrote once that well, Schelling, Schelling, Thomas Schelling had told him that uh, well they were all a bunch of idiots, so he quit eventually. Okay, they probably just didn't listen to him, and that, and, and so then he you know resigned. Um, and also the development of mathematical growth theory. And the practical application of Keynesian macroeconomics, which we had in the, Kane, the Kennedy era, new economics, were due to Cold War concerns. We were we wanted to grow faster than the Soviets, and we didn't want um, social unrest that resulted from high unemployment among minorities and so on that accompany business cycles. Okay, so um, uh, American economists, I'm quoting Bernstein, found themselves poised to participate in the realization of some of the most significant statist aims of the Cold War era. This is a left-winger writing this. 
A vigorous national economy was essential both to equip the armed forces and to demonstrate the superiority of American capitalism. Um, okay, so we got a tremendous specialization in economics. Um, not only that, we got economic imperialism in which we have so many economists now that, the, you know, the Chicago economists actually pushes imperialism. Um, we, 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 you know, they've moved into uh, into non sort of traditional areas of economics, like the economics of the family, the economics of uh, human capital, and so on and so forth. Um, behavioral economics. Okay, so Guido Hulsman suggested. Um, oh, let me mention one other thing regarding specialization. Mises pointed out a long time ago that quote: the economist must never be a specialist. In dealing with any problem, he must always fix his gaze upon the whole system. Economics does not allow uh, of any break breaking up into special branches. It invariably deals with the interconnectedness of all the phenomena of action. So economic specialization, in which there are different models that are not necessarily consistent with one another in different disciplines, that is a, is a, a, a deep error. Now, Guido Hulsman suggested to me that what I had written, I showed him a first draft of, 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 of this, and he said, well, you know what? He says, you've proved in some sense that economics is like fiat money. It's a creation of government. Without government, there could not be an economics profession. Not vocation, but profession. So um, let me just um, read a little bit of at the, at the end here. It's, um, so so what, what, what does this all led to? It leads to an important general point. The economics profession is a fiat phenomenon in the same sense as inconvertible paper money. Neither could, would or could exist on a market free of a specific pattern of government interventions. Government cannot directly command and coerce a newly issued fiat money into circulation into, into the, in the market economy. Government must first impose a series of interventionist method, method, measures such as legal tender laws, Repeated suspension of convertibility between paper promissory notes and the underlying gold money. The refusal to enforce gold clauses in private contracts. The banning of the private ownership of gold, etc. These interventions distort market processes and prepare the way for the gradual emergence of fiat money. The same is true of the emergence of the economics profession. In other words, the government could not say, let there be an economics profession. Okay, They wouldn't know how to develop such a complex social subsystem as, as an economics profession. But they, they could bring about certain interventions that then indirectly lead to the emergence of this um, profession. So government has no power to directly design and establish a profession with its peculiar interwoven customs, conventions, research, culture, and institutional infrastructure. Nonetheless, a natural vocation like economics can be transformed into a profession as a result of the distortion of market processes and the disturbing of property arrangements caused by wars, political control, and subsidized and subsidies of higher education, and the establishment of centralized bureaus and agencies to um, implement and oversee economic interventions. Um, so the medical profession is a, a natural profession that would exist on a free market because it is has a natural clientele. The economics profession, along with most other social science professions, is a fiat prof- profession that has no free market clientele and would only exist as a truth-seeking vocation. In other words, who's going to pay um, all of these economists? I mean, there, there might be a few economists that will have jobs in, in, in universities that, you know, for teaching basic principles of economics. Nobody's going to pay these hyper, uh, these, these over-educated, hyper-specialized people that are working on, pro- on problems that um, are totally unrealistic, are using methods that will not lead to any um, truthful applications or useful applications in the real world. Okay, um, so if we want to sum up, um, we can point out that the vocational economist strives to master the system of economic theory as handed down by the great system builders and the innovators of the past. Um, once the mastery is achieved, then depending on his ability or her ability, um, he or she is poised either to expand and apply this theoretical system. Okay, so you can do pure theory. Or you can tr- contribute a few important innovations or present a reformulation that embodies a, a, a number of major advances. It depends on, on your intellectual abilities. Um, there are very few individuals who are capable of, of uh, making, um, e- uh, embarking even on the first of these paths. Okay, just advancing pure theory a little bit. Okay. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is that any, 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 any position, whether it's in government, banking, or um, uh, academics, is for the vocational economy 
economist, strictly a way of, of earning a living so that he can carry on on, on his vocation. Okay. Um, also, what about progress in economics? The vocational economist measures progress in his discipline by the quantity and quality of minds that have mastered economic theory, because his own search for truth is really facilitated by uh, the the um, inter- interaction between different minds. Okay, pursuing the same calling. All right. So, um, on the other hand, the uh, professional economist in his research activities really aims at acclaim, public fame, wealth, uh, intellectual influence in, in shaping government policies, professional advancement, and, uh, and, and raw power and money. Okay, To a great extent, these ends are attainable only with government subsidies, and so he naturally supports an expansive and interventionist state. His natural roosting place, to which he continually returns after lucrative stints in government service, are the universities that are subsidized or directly controlled by government. He views progress in economics as a matter of the multiplication of its subdisciplines and sub-specialized bodies of theory. The increase of the sheer number of bodies in the graduate programs, and especially the expansion of opportunities to obtain lucre and positions of power in advising the interventionist welfare warfare state. Um, and what Mises, to end up, Mises perceptively pointed out in 1949, he said that professional economists, quote, rival the legal profession in the supreme conduct of political affairs. The eminent role they play is one of the most characteristic features of our age of interventionism. Okay, so, so that was Mises' view, unquote. Um, there was one point I wanted to make about uh, graduate programs. Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, uh, what I wanted to mention is that there are two ways, paths to take, then, in, in Austrian economics. Um, you can aim at, and you should aim at, an academic position. It does leave you the most time to pursue your, your vocation. Um, and in doing that, there, there are two ways to go. You can either go to uh, a program that is a, a mainstream program in which you learn the tools and techniques and, and so on, um, increasingly the mathematical techniques of uh, the uh, mainstream profession, but that you stay close to institutions like the Mises Institute which will then reinforce your, your 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 calling or your vocation, right? That's a hard road, but it's a road that that is certainly doable, and people are doing it. Um, I was gave a talk at uh, the um, Temple University this past year, and I met some students there, and um, they're they're very um, they're Austrian they're, they're Austrians that they, they were a uh, number of seniors that were graduating they wanted to go on and and, and pursue a vocation in Austrian economics and um, yeah okay I remember okay right 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 and so I, I was very uh, happy to meet meet you guys but but they pointed out you know what I, think, I don't know if you were the one but one, one was going on to uh, Syracuse's PhD program which emphasized applied economics you don't have to go into the the, the more mathematical fields I mean there is math obviously involved in all of this um, uh, uh, there are tracks in urban economics, uh, the field that this person was interested in. That wasn't you, right? No, okay. And includes urban, regional, and real estate economics and ranks third in the U.S. and in the world. He, uh, and, and he was also waiting for University of Pennsylvania's uh, decision about being accepted into a Ph.D. program in applied economics. Uh, and that's in the, the very prestigious Wharton School of Business. Okay. So there are increasingly alternative tracks in economics that are a little bit more applied, a little bit more real world that... Um, Austrians can go into. Um, someone else was waiting to uh, was was go, was going to enroll in the applied graduate economics program at Vanderbilt's graduate program in economic development, which features tra- uh, tracks in finance and banking, international development, and development of institutions, which is much less mathematically oriented than regular economics uh, programs. Okay, um, so these are ways that you can go there, and uh, that's one way. Okay. Another way to go, if you're interested in, in pursuing a vocation in Austrian economics, is that increasingly foreign universities in Europe, um, Guido Hulsman teaches that one, are amenable to accepting uh, American students, um, and uh, uh, where um, you're able to write a PhD under an Austrian-oriented economist. University of Angers is one example. Um, Dave Howden, who's a fellow here, is um, finishing up his PhD. Um, he's a Canadian um, at uh, um, the um, Ray uh, Juan Carlos University, um, the King John Juan Carlos University in Madrid, um, 
there, though, he had to, he did have to learn Spanish, okay, uh, before he could, um, enter the program. However, there's a new rule, as I understand it now, with the, um, European Union, in which if you enroll in two different, um, college or universities in the European Union, then you can choose any language to do your PhD in that is included in the European Union. So you can do it in English now. Okay? And you can work under Gita Hulsman or Word of the Soto. And um, you can write uh, a dissertation that is um, in English. Uh, the problem with this, of course, there, there are problems with, with, with this road also, is that there's a, there are certain accreditation features of American universities. If you want to get a job here, um, in a business school, you might, you, you might need to, to, to have a, um, a, a, a degree from an accredited graduate program, and some of these programs might not be accredited in the U.S. We're not, uh, we'll, we'll soon find out because many students are beginning to, um, or some students are beginning to take that route. Okay. Um, so the third route is is to go to a, a program that bills itself as an Austrian program. George Mason University does. Um, but since no Austrians have really dominated any department, it's really um, an eclectic program. There are, you are given some Austrian courses. You, are, you learn much less math. And you really, um, when you come out, you're not really a neoclassical economist. You haven't learned enough, enough math. And you're not really an Austrian economist. You're just a very eclectic economist. And um, that, 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 that's a third route to take. Uh, and um, whether or not that's optimal, Again, it's up, up to your own abilities and, and preferences and so on. So I'll stop and take, uh, we have some time for questions for people that are interested in um, possibly pursuing. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. So, um, journals don't, the journals don't won't discriminate. Journals won't discriminate, except in so far as the editor may look and see if you're, you're in an Ivy League school or, or, or the top, top 40, in which case, even if you go to an American university, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. What might, the problem may be for your students from European universities getting positions in research universities. But there should not be a problem in getting positions in the thousands, hundreds, and, and, and possibly thousands of, of liberal arts colleges that are spread all over the U.S. Okay. So, if you're willing for your vocation to, um, to teach a, a heavier course load, either three, 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 three courses per semester, or even four courses per semester in some places. It's kind of heavy. Um, and, and, and then to write, and, and usually the, the research requirements are much less. You can, you can publish in Austrian journals and so on. Then that's, that's certainly, um, a way to go. And we'll be finding out soon because some, some of our, um, fellows here at the Mises, um, university in the last few years are pursuing that route. Okay. So, um, it's really just, the, the research universities, which are um, really the worst places to be, because once you get there, unless unless you're writing in the top three, maybe it's the top two now, um, JPE and I think the QJE, unless you, unless you're getting hits in there, and, and and then and in that case you really have to just forsake Austrian economics, then you're not going to get tenure at these places anyway. It's a much more comfortable life, even though you have the heavier teaching load. And what's wrong with teaching actually? Um, well, there are things that are wrong with it, but, um, <laughs> takes time away from other things, but, um, unless, so, unless, you know, you, you, I think that it, it will work out that, that, that there will be jobs in those areas. Any other questions? Yes. 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 Yeah. No, I, I think that's the one area where Mises is not, is not right. I mean, he's, he's talking about himself in some sense. He acts as if the creative genius is a non-marginal actor. Who has the severe pain by, um, if he does not just allow his genius to, to burst out and flower. Okay. It's almost someone who's not a human being. It's almost an Uber bench. And I don't quite agree with that. What I do agree with is to the extent that he's talking about someone that has a vocation, which he does elsewhere, then I would agree that he's, what his main concern is, um, this internal goal of, of truth seeking. Not to earn money and so on, but that passage about the creative genius, where um, you know he he doesn't respond to any external incentives, is I think problematic. And and, and I remember Murray Rothbard saying that was the weakest part of of human action, um, because because that the creative genius in Mises' view is, is not really a human actor. If you read the passage in one way, I mean it's a very ambiguous passage. Other questions, comments? Okay. Oh yes, go ahead. Speak a little louder. Okay. You've only advertised. Right. 
Yes. The, the, the uh, Austrian Scholars Conference or Student Scholars Conference? Because that, that's a Grove City, that's a Grove City College. Okay, so that wouldn't come to us. But certainly, if you have ideas and, and you have a proposal to um, give a paper at the Austrian Scholars Conference, we're, we're, we're open to that. Okay. Just, no, no, we don't discriminate against people who don't have professional credentials. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you.